Um, <clears throat> Mr. Shields will be signing books after uh, the program out here in the hallway. Uh, we also have a number of programs coming up uh, here at the Jackson Center. Uh, there will be a, a talk on the 25th by author Gail Jarrow about uh, her biography of Justice Jackson. Um, in March, uh, every Wednesday in March, we will be showing a film here uh, at the center. Um, uh, those films uh, include To Kill a Mockingbird, um, Twelve Angry Men, Inherit the Wind, and Nuremberg, uh, which uh, is based on Justice Jackson. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we welcome uh, Charles Shields, who is um, uh, who spent four years uh, researching and writing the book Mockingbird. Uh, he is a former English teacher, and uh, he taught uh, a Harper Lee's novel for a number of years, uh, and uh, obviously later became a writer of nonfiction books for young people. Uh, for Mockingbird, he interviewed over 600 of Harper Lee's neighbors, childhood friends, law school classmates, uh, and Kansas residents who became her friends while she was helping uh, Truman Capote uh, research in cold blood. As a result of uh, Charles' research into uh, Capote's papers, the papers of Harper Lee's agent, and the archives in the courthouse and hu historical museum in Lee's hometown of Monroeville, Alabama, information never known um, appears in this insightful portrait of uh, Harper Lee, who hasn't uh, given uh, interviews, uh, or who stopped giving interviews in 1964. Uh, so <clears throat> without further ado, we'd like to welcome Charles Shields to the Jackson Center, and uh, we're in for quite a wonderful conversation. Thank you for that introduction, and um, it's an honor to be speaking here. Uh, Robert Jackson was a great man, and uh, to be in this, this place where um, justice is the theme of everything that surrounds you, uh, I think talking about To Kill a Mockingbird and about the, the theme of justice in that novel and the life of the woman who wrote that novel is especially appropriate. Uh, I'll tell you how I came to write this book and a little bit about the, the author herself, uh, how this novel occurred to her, the difficulties that she went through in writing it, and also I think uh, I'll get around to addressing the mystery of why she never published another book, which I think is on the minds of a lot of people who hold To Kill a Mockingbird uh, on their list of uh, most favorite books ever read. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird was published in 1960. I read it when I was in high school in 1965, and I began teaching it as an English teacher in the 1980s. And uh, like a lot of English teachers who know their stuff, uh, I never gave my students a piece of literature and asked them to just plunge into it. I would try to give them some context for the book and I acquainted them with the context of the times, of the South in the 1930s, uh, segregation and things like that, because you have to understand that with young people, that time, the Great Depression, and that part of the country uh, seems very, very long ago. To them, it's the Civil War. And so I, I had to acquaint them with some of the key uh, ideas and, and um, problems facing this nation at that time. And then they would want to know more about the author. And I would want to tell them more about the author, because if, if you're going to teach a, a poem like The Raven by Poe or, or The Old Man the Sea by Hemingway, uh, you want to give some background about the, the author so that they engage a little more with the text. And uh, one of the first questions that they would ask is, well, Harper Lee, is he still alive? <laughs> and, and I would say, well, actually, it's a woman, and her name is Nell Harper Lee. And the reason that she didn't put Nell on the cover of the book is because she disliked it when people would mispronounce her name Nellie. It's spelled N-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and people would say Nellie. Uh, so when it came time to actually put her name on a, on a publication, she chose Harper Lee. They would want to know, well, how much of this is autobiographical? Is this her story? Did she grow up in the South? Um, it was her father an attorney. And I tried to find out as much as I could about the author. And those of you who are users of, of libraries know that there are 
whole encyclopedia is devoted to the lives of authors. Uh, the Gale series is an excellent resource, for example. There's a Gale series on young author, authors for young people and adult authors. And most of those authors have at least a two-page profile. There's very little on Harper Lee. Well, then, all right, your next uh, resort is to go to an encyclopedia, where any ninth, enterprising ninth grader might go. Try this experiment yourself. Open up three encyclopedias to the entry Lee Harper. And what you're going to find underneath are a couple of paragraphs. The first two sentences or so of each entry always agree that Harper Lee was born in Monroeville, Alabama in the mid-1920s, and her father, Amansa Coleman Lee, was an attorney. But from there on out, the information about Harper Lee goes in all different directions. For example, one encyclopedia will say that she went to Oxford University on a Fulbright for a year to study law very prestigious. Another one will say, no, no, actually she went to Oxford University for a year to study English. Actually, Harper Lee went to Oxford University as part of a summer student exchange program during her junior year in college. One encyclopedia will say, and she graduated from the University of Alabama with a degree in law. Another one will say, no, no, she graduated with a degree in English. Actually, Harper Lee never graduated from the University of Alabama. But all encyclopedias agree that she is a direct descendant of Robert E. Lee, which is absolutely wrong. <laughs> she is not a direct descendant of Robert E. Lee. I followed her line all the way back to when the first Lee, John Lee Esquire, was born and raised uh, in the Tidewater area of Virginia and followed the Lee family on their migratory journey down the eastern seaboard across the Florida Panhandle and into southern Alabama, where they became, incidentally, poorer and poorer the further, further south they went, to the point where her uh, great-grandfather was a uh, really a dirt farmer, a subsistence farmer living in southern Alabama. And her father, her grandfather, was a uh, soldier in the 15th Alabama Regiment. But at no point does her line cross Robert E. Lee's line. They're two separate families. So I thought, well, this is a great literary mystery because Consider these facts about To Kill a Mockingbird. Every year, uh, approximately 100,000 young people read the book for the first time because it's taught in two-thirds of American public high schools. In 1995, Reader's Digest asked its readers, what are the five most influential books in your life? Five books that have really touched you and made a difference. And when the results came in, they varied by region. But To Kill a Mockingbird was solidly on that list of five in various places. But the only book that consistently outranked To Kill a Mockingbird in terms of its influence was the Bible. I've met young people named Atticus. I've met girls nicknamed Scout. I've met people who have come up to me and said, I became an attorney because I read To Kill a Mockingbird as a teenager. And I wanted to be like Atticus. I wanted to do something meaningful I, I wanted to help, and I, he's my hero, he's my role model. And so I thought, this book has touched so many people, and yet we know so little about the author. And yet she's still alive. She went to public schools. She attended the University of Alabama. There must be a paper trail somewhere. And like all this, she had friends. She attended graduation ceremonies where she walked across the stage. She joined clubs. If I put on my detective's hat, I can probably solve this literary mystery. And so I started down the road, and little did I think that it would take four years to find out the story of Harper Lee. And this is what I found out. To Kill a Mockingbird is really the result of an enormous creative risk taken by a young woman when she was in her 20s. You know, so often in life when you want to do something important, risk is involved. Nothing is gained easily, and for this young woman from a small town in Alabama to even try to become a novelist involved risk. And through a series of events, the stakes became greater and greater and greater, and yet she wasn't discouraged. What happened was her father owned, uh, her father was a partner in a law firm in Monroeville, Alabama when Harper Lee was growing up. He was a partner in the law firm of Barnett, Bug, and Lee. 
I don't think Charles Dickens could come up with a better name for a law firm than Barnett, Bug, and Lee. And he was Lee. Now, his eldest daughter, Alice, in the 1930s, had graduated from the uh, Birmingham College of Law in Alabama and joined the firm as its junior partner. Now, consider that in the 1930s, there were only a dozen female lawyers in the entire state of Alabama. And now, one of those is his junior partner in his law firm. And to add to his pride as a farmer, Nell was also expressing an interest in the law. When she was a girl, she would go to the courthouse and watch her father present a case. She would listen to the dinner table conversations between her sister and her father, and she evinced every sign of being interested in the law. And he thought, how wonderful would this be if not only my eldest girl, but my youngest girl joined the law firm. And of the dozen lawyers in the state, two of them would be in the family. In fact, he started telling a little joke at Rotary. You know, someday I may have to change the name of that law firm from Barnett, Bug, and Lee to Lee and Daughters Associates. Well, Nell wanted to please her father. And being the dutiful, respectful, adoring daughter that she was, when she went off to the University of Alabama, she declared herself a law major, with fully intending to get a degree in law. Now, she also wanted to please her mother. And her mother had attended a private boarding school for girls called Julia Tutwiler's School for Girls in Alabama. And it was what we would call now a finishing school, sort of a college prep academy. The young ladies were taught to appreciate symphonic music, to play a musical instrument, how to set a nice table, how to entertain, how to appreciate art, how to speak a foreign language. And her mother was quite socially well turned out, besides being quite bright. Mrs. Lee wanted her daughter, Nell, to learn some of these graces, and so she encouraged her to join a sorority at the University of Alabama. Nell did. She joined Chi Omega which was socially a very competitive university during the war. By now, we're up to about 1941, and she's at the University of Alabama. As a matter of fact, there were two former Miss Alabamas in the house when Nell joined. This was quite a group. Within just a few months, Nell realized she'd made a mistake, and the girls realized that she, they had made a mistake in asking her to join. Not that she was recalcitrant, not that she somehow made fun of their values. She just wasn't a participant. She didn't share the same mindset that they did about the nature of belonging to a sorority. They were interested in social activities. They participated in charity events. For example, on a Friday night when the girls were doing their nails and talking about their dates and where they were going, Mel didn't have a date. On Saturday mornings when they got up and put on their robes, you know, and tied the belts and talked about the dances they'd been to and the things that they'd done, Nell could usually be seen going out the front door with a uh, bag of golf clubs over her shoulder on her way out to the links because she loved to play golf. It was her hobby. And so she just wasn't a good fit. After a year, she dropped out of Chi Omega and she went into independent housing. And honestly, she was lost. She was lost on this big campus that had the nickname the Country Club of the South because it was made up primarily of middle and upper middle class white kids, of which she was solidly one, and she could do the work. She had no trouble holding her own in class, but she couldn't find her niche at this big university. She heard then in the summer of her sophomore year that the campus newspaper, the Crimson White, was looking for a humor columnist. Somebody who once a week would write something funny. Something that would add a little levity to the other, otherwise rather heavy editorial page. Nell tried out. She got the job. I think during the summer there wasn't a lot of competition anyway. But she nicknamed her column Caustic Comet. And she started making fun of things on campus. She poked fun at the food in the dormitories and how long it took to stand in the registration lines and things like that. And she was quite good in print, very funny. At times, she's, you know, at times she's a little bit uh, exaggerated, a little, little too much hyperbole. She, after all, she was a young woman. 
but I think she shared that quality with Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, he wrote with a pen warmed in hell. And I think she showed signs of that, too. She even started writing about some rather touchy subjects. For example, segregation was not considered a polite topic of conversation. Nell talked about it in her columns. There were a couple of letters to the editor about laying on with a rather heavy brush the comments about the nature of the South and things like that, but she persevered. The University of Alabama also had a humor magazine that came out quarterly called the Rammer Jammer, and it was like the Harvard Lampoon. Every quarter it would make fun of a na national publication like Esquire magazine or the National, uh, or the, I was going to say National Enquirer, the uh, National Geographic, National Geographic. And uh, she gravitated to the magazine, and by her senior year, she was editor-in-chief of the Rammer Jammer, writing articles, laying out articles, assigning photographs, writing commentary, and simultaneously, she was in law school. And after she would get done at the magazine offices, she would go home and study for the next day's uh, topics, next day's lectures in criminal law and real estate law. It was a difficult life and she reached a crossroads. Here is one of those moments when she had to take a risk. Christmas vacation, her senior year, she went home and she told her father, I don't want to be a lawyer. He was thunderstruck, as any of you would be who had just paid for three and a half years of college, only to have your daughter announce, I don't want to do it. And he said, well, I'm not saying you have to get the degree, I'm not saying you have to practice law, but it's just good to have the degree. And she said, I don't think I can pass the exams. In those days, to pass the Alabama bar, you had to sit in a room like this and respond to hypothetical cases from your head, essay style. In other words, you had to write a brief based on case law that you knew. She said, my heart's not in it. I don't think I can you know, persuade my professors that I should be a lawyer. And actually, I spoke to some of her law classmates, and they said they couldn't imagine her being a lawyer because she was so quiet in class. She didn't belong to any study groups that they could tell she was not a gunner. You know, she was not enthusiastic about this. So her father said, all right, you don't want to get a degree in law. What do you want to do? She said. I want to go to New York and be a writer. Well, you can imagine how this went over. A girl from a small Alabama town of 1,500 in the Deep South wants to go to Manhattan and make her living by the pen. She's going to pay her rent. She's going to pay her utilities. She's going to pay for her food by writing. And all she's ever published is, are, are things on campus at the University of Alabama. She has never sold a short story. She's never sold a poem. But this is her new plan. She's going to be a writer. He said, as many of you would say, all right, I paid for college. I'm not paying for this. If you want to go to New York and find out what it's like to make it on your own, you go. And she said, all right, I will. So for about a year, she worked at the local country club and as a waitress and she saved up her money, and sometime in the late 1940s, fall of 1948 or so, she took the train from uh, a small town in Alabama all the way up to Penn Station in New York, sitting up a 26-hour ride. Her mother wanted her to look nice when she arrived in Manhattan, so she wore long white gloves and she had high heels, and she staggered into Penn Station with her luggage and her typewriter and prepared to take on the Big Apple. Well, it's 1948. All these young GIs and their wives are looking for housing. There was a housing shortage on. There were almost 10,000 people living in Quonset huts outside New York City waiting for available housing. Hence, we get Levittown and things like that because people needed homes. And here's this young woman from the South looking for a place to live. She stayed with a friend for about a month, and finally she found a one-bedroom apartment in an old German neighborhood in New York called Yorkville, where Lou Gehrig grew up. This one-bedroom apartment had no hot water, 
no stove and no furniture. She said, I'll take it. And she moved in. The first order of business was to purchase a chair to sit in. For a couple of bucks, she bought a chair and she sat down and here she is in New York. Now, she has to, be a, she has to have a place to write. I, as I explained to young people, this is before laptops, you can't balance a 25 pound underwood on your knees, you have to have a desk. So she takes the door off the closet, she props it up on some concrete blocks that she found, and this door becomes her combination table, bill paying area, writing room. So she has a chair and a desk, she buys a hot plate to heat up her food on, and she's so broke that when she walks down the street at night, if the police aren't looking, she gives parking meters a sock with her fist in the hope that a nickel or a dime will pop out the slot. Because in those days, for a nickel you can buy a cup of coffee and for a dime you can get a sandwich. And this is how she's living. Now her father's thinking she's going to come home any time. You know, that someday, a Hollywood type scene, it's raining, so there's a knock at the door, he opens the door, here's Nell with her hair all bedrazzled, Dad, you were so right, she doesn't show. In fact, a friend tipped her off to the fact that a really good job in a city is a union job because you get overtime. If you work uh, longer, you get time and a half. If you work holidays, you get double time and you get benefits. She got a union job as an airline reservationist with, with Eastern Airlines in Midtown Manhattan. And she worked at that job for eight years. It was a job that barely required a high school diploma. She stood at a desk, she had a map of the inside of the airplane, and as people paid for their seats, she marked off the seat. That was her job. And she wrote at night and she wrote on the weekends. Now what was she writing? I mean, was she trying out her hand as a playwright? Was she, was she writing poetry? How was she finding her way? Actually, as a writer, she had a pretty good notion of what she wanted to write about. She was adhering to that piece of advice given to a lot of young writers, which is write about what you know. She was a young woman in New York City. She wasn't a New Yorker. She could go down to Harlem to hear jazz, but she wasn't into the beat scene. I talked to a couple of people who remember her going to parties. She was the type to get her drink and go sit in the corner and have a small conversation with someone. But she was not, you know, an extrovert. So what is she going to, what's her heart in? What does she have a visceral feel about? Being a little girl in the South, growing up in a little town. So in her mind's eye, she looked up and down her street in Monroeville, Alabama, which was called South Alabama Avenue, and she found her story. And she found her characters. Now I'm not saying that To Kill a Mockingbird is a memoir. I'm not saying that it's, it's strictly autobiographical, but many of those people did exist. For example, when you read To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee is Scout. That little girl, that precocious little girl, who is a little bit lippy and you know, a little bit uh, kind of a roughhouser. Everybody I spoke to who went to school with Harper Lee said, that's just her. That's the way she was in the fourth grade. And living right next door to Harper Lee when she was growing up was a little blonde-haired boy whose folks had dumped him there. His name was Truman Streckfus Pearsons. His mom and his dad were young party-goers, and they found that having a small child slowed them up. And so they dropped them there, him there in Monroeville with his elderly cousins, three unmarried sisters. He missed his mother, Lily Mae, so much. She was a beautiful young woman of about 20. Truman missed his mother so much that one time when she blew into town and saw him for a couple of hours and then went away again in a rented limo, he discovered that she had left behind a bottle of her perfume and he drank it. He wanted a part of her essence to be with him. He wanted to smell like his mom. That lonely little boy is Dill in To Kill a Mockingbird. The little boy next door who says, my folks don't want me. And Truman Streckfus Pearsons grew up to became, become a writer as well. His mother remarried, and he took his stepfather's last name, and Truman became Truman Capote. I don't, I've never, I don't know of any other instance in American literary history where you have two authors living right next to each other who are the same age and their friends. 
I mean, you can go to Concord and you could bump into Emerson, Hawthorne, Thoreau, but they tended to be a different generations. You know, they weren't, Emerson was much older than, than Thoreau, but not, not uh, Truman and Nell, they were one grade apart. So we have a scout and we have a dill who, who figures in the book, and um, who else is real? Well, across the street was an English teacher, uh, Nell's favorite in high school, who became um, uh, the, uh, her teacher. Yeah, he figures in the novel as well. And down the street is a young man who never came out, named Arthur Boulevard Jr. Arthur Boulevard was afraid to come out because his father kept him inside for destroying public property. And that young man figured it became the model for Boo Radley in the book. He was so closely, uh, he was so recognizable that when To Kill a Mockingbird came out, his two sisters, uh, Sally and Mary, threatened to sue Harper Lee because everyone in town knew that that was their brother. So she has taken the line that everything in the book is fictional. Actually, everything in the book is not entirely fictional. And one aspect of the book that is worth bringing out is the case of Tom Robinson. If you remember the book, a black man in the book is falsely accused of molesting a white woman and is put on trial and is sentenced uh, by the jury. Uh, and at that time, that kind of crime uh, carried extremely serious consequences. Now, before you dismiss it as just a book or, or as just a story, I should tell you that one of the reasons that Harper Lee worked so hard on To Kill a Mockingbird was she wanted to honor her father. Her father is the model for Atticus Finch. Mr. Lee was every inch Atticus Finch. He was an attorney. He was a respected man. He was very anti-Klan and said so in his editorials in the newspaper. Um, he was twice elected to the state legislature, just as Atticus was in the book. And there was one other sort of secret side to her father that she wanted to address in To Kill a Mockingbird. Something very terrible happened to him when he was a young man, and I think you'll see the parallels between To Kill a Mockingbird and what happened to her father. When her father was a, a young lawyer in the early 1920s, with only a few years under his belt of practicing law, he had never, tr he'd never been involved in a criminal law case before, never handled the defense of someone accused of a, of a crime, and he was appointed to defend two young black men accused of murder. Now this murder was really a botched robbery. What happened was these two young men planned to go to an unelectrified little mom and pop type store by the Alabama River and when the sun went down it became so dim and shady in there that the owner tended to just lock up whenever it got too dark and his customers weren't, wouldn't be coming along anymore. So these young guys, in, on a hot August night, it was in the early, low 90s, I looked it up in the Weather Bureau records, it was in the low 90s, 9 o'clock at night, they went to the store and the plan was one would stand on the porch and one would go inside and in the, and in the dimness ask the owner to reach up and get him down some brown mule tobacco up there on the shelf. And when the owner turned around, the guy would hit him on the back of the head with it was a, actually an oak branch. And while the man was stunned, they would grab the cigar box that he used for a cash register and just beat it. And that was going to be the extent of the robbery, and that was their plan. Everything went according to plan. One stood watch on the porch, one went inside, the storekeeper turned around, reached up, and he was hit on the back of the head. Unfortunately, he was 84 years old, and he was killed from the blow. Before he hit the ground, it was a dirt floor store, before he hit the ground, he was dead. And what became a, a ham-handed robbery turned into a capital crime of black on white. And the punishment, if found guilty, was hanging. Now, think of this. Why would you give such a serious case to a young lawyer with no criminal experience? Because you want him to lose. Because you don't want it to take very long. And you might be surprised to learn that in the 1920s and 1930s, cases involving black defendants in the, in the Deep South lasted sometimes as little as six minutes. What would happen is the judge would say, how do you plead? 
And the defense attorney would stand up and say, he pleads guilty, Your Honor, and he throws himself on the mercy of the court. And the judge would say, 10 years on a chain gang for drinking, 15 years on a chain gang for fighting. Because chain gangs were run by for-profit corporations. The state paid them to take these criminals. And it was easy to just get them off the books. Well, Mr. Lee has his case, but he's not going to go down easily. He shows up on the morning of the trial with six typed out objections. I've seen them. And uh, here is the panel of all white males, all registered voters, all property owners. And when the trial begins, Mr. Lee stands up immediately and says, Your Honor, I object to something. And you can imagine the judge rolling his eyes and thinking, you know, well, let's not take this too seriously. And he says, well, Mr. Lee, what do you object to? And Lee says, Your Honor, I object to the fact that the dead man's son is on the jury. <laughs> and the judge says, overruled. What else? Lee says, Your Honor, I object to the fact that when the sheriff handed out the summons to the juryman, I have it down from witnesses that he didn't just give them the summons, that he stopped into their kitchens and he had a cup of coffee or he had a slice of pie and he discussed the case with them. And long and the short of it is, Your Honor, this jury's already made up their minds. They know everything about this case and they've reached a verdict. We need to impanel new jurors. Well, the prosecuting attorney, who was a man in his 50s and a legend on the Ninth Circuit down there, jumped up and said, Your Honor, what is the likelihood of finding 12 qualified men in this county? And we've asked these men to give up their time as merchants and farmers to come in here. And now we're going to say, thank you very much. Sorry you've lost the shank of the day. Go home. The judge said overruled. All six objections were overruled. Two and a half hours later, both men were found guilty of murder and sentenced to hang. On a rainy day in the third week of November, they were taken out of their cells across the street from the courthouse, led up to an iron catwalk where there was a trap door and asked if they had anything to say. Both men apologized, said they never meant for this to happen, and they were hanged. Now, that would be a saddening enough end to the first case ever handled by a young, earnest attorney. But there was more to come. It turned out the dead man had another son who lived in upstate New York. And a few weeks after the hanging, probably about 10 days actually, he received a package wrapped in brown paper. And the return address was Monroeville, Alabama. And he thought, who could be sending me a package? And then he thought, well, Christmas is coming up, must be kin. And he took off the wrapping, and sure enough, it was wrapped in Christmas packaging, or Christmas paper. And he took off the Christmas paper, and it was a shoebox with a tight-fitting lid. And he took off the lid of the shoebox, and inside was some newspaper that was folded over, and there were small spots of dried blood on the newspaper. Spreading apart the newspaper, he saw inside the scalps of the two hanged men, with a note saying, Justice has been done in Alabama. Mr. Lee never took another criminal case for the rest of his life. Not because he was frightened, not because he didn't want to be tarred by it, but because he was not going to participate in a pantomime. He was not going to participate in a system that was not meant to protect the indigent, the illiterate, the frightened, the uninfluential. He was not going to act like he was helping someone receive the full benefit of the law when in fact there was no possibility that they were going to get it, that what was going to happen to them was a foregone conclusion. So for the rest of his 83 years he practiced tax law uh, and divorce and you know, property transfer and he was a reliable man in those regards but he would never take another criminal case. So to kill a mockingbird is really a way of redressing what happened to her father, whom she loved very much. It's an opportunity to make a good man the hero of a book that takes place in a small town. Now, I should tell you that the working title of the book, as she was working on it, was called Atticus. It was not called To Kill a Mockingbird, and I'll tell you in a bit why the title was changed. Well, she finished what she thought was her novel, finally, 
In 1956, she had been working on and off about seven years on the book, seven or eight years, and Truman, who by this time was a literary sensation, having written uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's and The Grass Harp and several movie scripts for John Huston, uh, tipped her off to the fact that there was a publisher that might be interested in her book, J.B. Lippincott and Company. Actually, J.B. Lippincott and Company would be interested in any book because they hadn't had a hit in 15 years. The previous bestseller was The Egg and I, but they had not had anything on any of the major lists for years. So here comes this young woman, very earnestly, who deposits her manuscript with the editorial office there at Lippincott. She's so worried about the reaction, she doesn't even make an appointment to see anybody. She just leaves the manuscript with a note saying, if this is any good, please call me. Two weeks later, she gets a call from a lovely woman named Tay Hohoff, a Quaker raised in Philadelphia, a woman in her 60s, who's also working with another nervous young writer named uh, Thomas Pinchon. And Tay calls her and says, would you like to come in? I'd like to talk to you. And she thinks, hallelujah, I've been in New York all this time. And finally, an editor wants to talk to me about my book. So she goes to the meeting, and she's trying to put on her best behavior, and she's all, yes, ma'am, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am. And Tay tells her this, Miss Lee, you really have a natural voice as a writer. I can just taste that sour dust coming off the roads in Alabama. I can feel the heat coming down out of that hot blue sky in the summertime. You made me laugh. You made me wonder what was going to happen next. Really, you, you've got it. But the bad news is, you don't know how to write a novel. And Harper Lee's response was something on the order of, well, it's long and it's got a lot of people in it. <laughs> well, if that was the only criterion for writing a novel, then a telephone book would be a novel. What she didn't understand was the structure of a novel, which is that characters start out here and they think they understand who they are and where they live and the way things are in life. And then there's a series of crises and they have to make choices like we all do during you know, uh, difficult times in our life. Then comes a major crisis, a major crossroad. <coughs> then there's a falling off and the plot is resolved at the end and you put the book down and you feel like, boy, that was an experience. Who would have thought that it started here and it ended up over here? And she didn't know how to do that. And so Harper Lee asked Tay, well, then what have I got? And her editor said, what you have are a lot of little scenes about life in a small town. A lot of little funny sketches, a lot of tall tales, a lot of, you know, there was this guy with a jug over his shoulder, and, but it doesn't add up to a hill of beans. Would you be willing to write this again? Now, who would have blamed her if after all this time she said, would I be willing to write this again? I've been in New York a long time. Um, I work on this at night and on weekends. If I haven't got it here on the first pass, I don't think so. And a lot of writers, would-be writers, fall by the wayside because they're disappointed and they have thin skins and they say, if this isn't it, then forget it. To her credit, she said, if you help me, I'll do it again. It took her two and a half years to rewrite it, and she had to rewrite the book three times from beginning to end because she couldn't get it right. She couldn't get it right in terms of whether it should be first person, third person, or a combination of the two. And actually now, it's a combination of the two. It's both first, scout talking, and third, scout grown up looking back when she's older, which is a real hat trick and probably very difficult to bring off. In fact, one night the book almost broke her heart. In November 1959, when she was two-thirds done with the third draft of the book, it was snowing outside and she was still seated at her door desk. Now I realize that she's been in New York almost a decade. And she's got the book, two-thirds of it typed here, and she's got a page in the typewriter, and she's trying to think of something to type, and she, she types something, and she thinks, no, I've already said that. And then she types something else, she's not, nah, that's not gonna go anywhere. And she starts to cry. And what she realizes is she hates this book. <laughs> she hates everything about this book. Everybody else gets to go on with their lives, you know? People get to go places, people get to make friends, people, but no, 
she's sitting in this crummy apartment in a rather ratty neighborhood where the, they forget to pick up the trash, literally, uh, and she's working at a door on a novel about the South. She tears the paper out of the typewriter, she puts it on their manuscript, she walks over to the window, she raises the window and she takes what will be one of the most popular books of the 20th century and throws it into the snow. Then she slams the window and she calls Tay at home and she says, I quit. I don't want to be a writer. I've had absolutely enough. I don't think I've got it because I put things in and I take things out and I start down a different path and I just went out of this whole business. I'm sorry I ever got involved. Well now, Mrs. Hohoff is a woman who's been involved in this for a long time and she has worked with a lot of authors who've gotten lost in the woods and she knows what to say. First of all, she says to Nell, it's not your book to throw out in the alley. We've worked together on this for two and a half years. The book has improved partly because of my professional advice. So what is blowing around out there is partly my work. Secondly, there's the small matter of the contract and the advance. We've given you $8,000 to work on the book so that you can meet your deadline. If you read the language of the contract, it says, if you don't deliver the book, then you must repay the advance. Do you have $8,000? So Nell put on her coat, and she goes back out <laughs> in the alley, and she picks up the pages, and she brings them back in. And in those days, I have to remind students, there are no word processors. She has to, these pages have motor oil on them and everything else. She has to retype the manuscript, and she sends it in. And she tells people in Monroeville that all she's hoping for now is a merciful death. <laughs> she's so sick at this book. Now, Tay doesn't want her to be disappointed and tells her, Nell, if you only sell 2,500 copies of the book, you should be pleased because that's the break-even number. You're a first-time novelist. Nobody knows your name. And what she didn't tell her was that a book with the topic of racial injustice in 1960 is not going to make people sprint to their local bookstore. A lot of Americans, myself included, pretty much assumed that that, you know, the way we lived at that time was the way things were. I mean, you know, it was just how America had shaken out and people were comfortable in the neighborhoods that they lived in and the schools they went to and that was it. So Nell was looking forward to selling a few thousand books and the next time out, 5,000 and the third time out, 10,000. Instead, when the book came out in July of 1960, reviews all over the country were positive. The Tennessee Chattanoogan said, you could go to church for a year and not learn as much about how to get along with people as you could learn from reading this little book on the weekend. And it was like that everywhere. By the end of 1960, she had sold half a million copies of To Kill a Mockingbird. She was receiving approximately 60 letters a day from people and trying to answer them individually. And they all had different questions. In May of 1961, she won the Pulitzer Prize. First time out, Truman could just spit. <laughs> I mean, Nell had never craved a publicity and things, and he lived for it. He wanted to know everything about everybody, and here the little girl next door won the Pulitzer. She got $500 for it. She gave it to the local library so they could buy their first set of encyclopedias. They never had any. In the summer of 1961, uh, it was translated into eight foreign languages, including Persian, Japanese, German, and French. And then it was made into a low-budget motion picture. And you know, if you look at the production values of To Kill a Mockingbird with Gregory Peck, it really is a shoestring operation. It's not much above an independent film. It was put together by two young, eager guys, producer and director, who really wanted to do something worthwhile. It was only their second film out. The first one was the Jimmy Pearsall story. This was their second film. And, no, Fear Strikes Out. Fear Strikes Out, the Jimmy Pearsall story. And uh, Gregory Peck believed in that movie so much that he put up a big chunk of the change to make it because they couldn't get a big studio to sign on. The objections were that there was no gunplay, there was no romance, who's gonna go see this? 
So Gregory Peck put up a lot of the money, and then they got Broadway actors to be the main characters, and they got two kids from Birmingham who lived four blocks apart to be Scout and Jem, and Dill was the younger brother of Connie Stevens, the actress, who had been in a Broadway show himself. And um, that's how the movie was made. There's really only two sets, the street and the courthouse. The film was nominated for eight Academy Awards. It went up against Lawrence of Arabia, which took seven years to make, starring thousands of Arabs going back and forth on camels, on location in 75 millimeter color. And Peck wins Best Actor, and the film wins Best Screenplay, and it wins Best Musical Score by Elmer Bernstein. It was a phenomenon. And then Harper Lee discovered something. She didn't like being famous. She didn't, it was something she never bargained for. She never really thought it would get to that point. The idea was to be a writer, to publish something, to be able to walk into a bookstore with a friend and say, look, there's my book. You know, it was something to give to her father. And in fact, he did live to see the publication of the book. And people would walk up to him on the street in Monroeville and say, Mr. Lee, would you please sign your daughter's book? But don't sign it, Mr. Lee. Sign it, Attic. And he signed the book Atticus Finch. <laughs> and the reason they changed the title, I meant to get you know, back to that, was that uh, she was not involved in the marketing side of the book at all. She took direction from her editor as well she should. And they explained to her that Atticus was not a good title. Because first of all, it sounded like a Greek city. It might end up in the travel section or geography or ancient history. And you know, uh, you only get, as a writer, you only get 15 seconds for a reader to buy your book. Think of it yourself. You walk along, you take out a book, you look at the title, mm, you open it up, maybe, maybe not, that's it, or it goes, and it goes back on the shelf. Atticus is very off-putting, but To Kill a Mockingbird is intriguing. Mockingbird says South, and kill is always a good word <laughs> to have in a title. You know, what about what? So that's why they chose, and also Atticus says something about killing a mockingbird being a, a gratuitously cruel act in the book. Well, by 1964, Nell quit giving interviews entirely. She told a friend, I'm tired of talking about the bird. I, I don't want to be asked any more questions about it. She was particularly annoyed with people asking, when's the next book coming out? Because as she said to her cousin, Dickie Williams, you know, when you've been to the top of a mountain, there's only one way off down. And she was worried she would disappoint her fans. After all, when you've had a sensation, you know, when you've won the Pulitzer, where do you go? What do you hope for? The National Book Award in one lifetime? So it may well be that, that Nell Harper Lee has written another novel. In fact, I've heard a rumor out in the publishing community that she has. But it won't come out until after she's gone because she doesn't want the publicity. Today, Harper Lee lives with her sister, Alice. Alice is in her mid-90s. Nell is in her mid-80s. Alice goes into the law firm of Barnett, Bug, and Lee three days a week to practice law. She's this big, she uses a walker, she wears running shoes, and she's deaf as a post. But she goes in three days a week. She's known as the tax lady because she does everybody's taxes. The two unmarried ladies live in a brick ranch house across the street from the elementary school. They go to the Methodist church where their father was a deacon twice a week for Wednesday night service and for Sunday morning service. After Wednesday night service, they go to Hardy's for coffee. After Sunday, they like to go to Dave's Catfish Cabin for the child's portion of fried catfish, hush puppies, and sweet tea. And if you pass their table, you might hear somebody's hearing aid going, wee, and then they argue about who's is doing it and who should turn it down. <laughs> and then they get the check, and then they go pick up Nell's letters, and she still gets between 40 and 60 letters a week, because the third generation of people is reading this book. And young people today still want to know, are you Scout? Was your dad Atticus? You know, was there really a Boo Radley? No, it was all fiction. But you know, she. She doesn't respond much to those questions anymore. Um, she had a mild stroke last year, but she's doing well. 
Now, why do we continue to read this book? I'll just conclude this on this note. What is it about this book that contributes to its appeal? Why is it read all over the world? Well, first of all, it's just a very good story. And there will always be a place on people's shelves and on library shelves for a story that draws you in and engages you and touches your heart. So in that regard, it's just a good yarn. I know people who read To Kill a Mockingbird annually as a treat to themselves. Or they read it in the fall because that's the time that they read it for the first time. Or they read it on their birthday. Something like that. They just want to go back to that little town and they want to go into the past. The second reason that the book is, is great. I think the book does something, well the book treats a topic which is a universal concern to all human beings, which is how to get along with each other. Wherever we live on this planet, that's a great challenge. We're separated by differences of faith and differences of appearance, differences of, of behavior and values and philosophical differences, and it's a great hurdle. And we tend to protect ourselves by being suspicious of the other and assuming that they aren't doing it right or they're up to no good. I'll tell you a little anecdote from my own experience. I'm married to a lovely Mexican-American lady named Guadalupe. And shortly after we were married, we were in a grocery store in the produce section. And uh, Guadalupe's first language is Spanish, uh, but um, uh, she speaks English as, as well as I do. But right next to us were three young Mexican men. Um, and they were speaking Spanish very rapidly. And I could only pick out a couple of words. And they seemed to be getting really exercised about something over there. And I thought, maybe there's some problem or they're angry. So I leaned over to Lupe and I said, what are they talking about? And she listened and she said, the oranges here are cheaper than at the other store. <laughs> but I assumed that something wrong was happening by their intonations and the fact that I couldn't understand what they were saying. So this, you know, whether it's an, a trial or whether it's meeting a stranger, it's hard to let down your defense and just listen and assume goodness in the other human being or decency. The last thing I think that, that is, distinguishes this book as a great piece of literature is something that's true of all great pieces of literature, which is that it asks you questions as you read it. And you may be unaware that you're being asked those questions. There are some books that are merely entertaining. And those books have their place. If you're on a long airplane voyage and you're immersed in the Da Vinci Code, great. If you, if you read, you know, something by, uh, well, I can't think of it. I don't read those popular fiction books. But if you're reading something like that and when you get off the plane, you leave it on the seat, you might think, oh darn it, but then maybe you're glad that somebody else is going to read it. But a really great piece of literature, as you read it, makes you wonder about the nature of your life. I mean, as you read To Kill a Mockingbird, you think to yourself, could I stand up for what's right? Could I swim upstream? I mean, think of Atticus Finch. People told him, you know, they're making fun of your children at school because of what you're doing. You know that they're suffering. You're making a stand. That's fine and good. You're an adult. But they're taking the heat. He was told by his brother, this isn't going to do your career any good. Why are you taking this case? Isn't there somebody else who could stand up who's got less to lose? You live in a small town. You've got to face your neighbors. And he said, I've got to do it. I'm sworn to uphold the law. And somebody's got to do it. I mean, look around at this room, at this gallery of monsters, because that's really what they are. These people were held to account for what they did by people who felt that there had to be justice done in the name of all the people who were not there to testify or to, 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 to be found uh, not guilty or to be forgiven or to have their lives validated. And it's only the, the leaders among us who will stand up and say, I'll do the heavy lifting. In every small town, there's people like this. 
there's teacher, there are teachers and, and there are policemen and firemen and, and there will never be statues to them. You know, a park won't be named after them. That there may never be a, a place like this in your name. But that doesn't mean that you can't be one of those who stands up and says, no, or I will. Whatever answer is necessary to do what's right. And that's what distinguishes To Kill a Mockingbird, is it addresses those important questions of, can you be counted? Will you stand up? And at what cost? So that's the story of To Kill a Mockingbird and how it came to be written and why it has such an impact on people. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, um, to, Ki uh, to Kill a Mockingbird is one of the 100 most banned books in the United States. Uh, and for a number of reasons. There's not just one reason. <laughs> people take umbrage with it for all sorts of reasons. Uh, there are some people who don't like the use of the racial epithet that's in the book. Uh, they find it personally offensive. There are people who don't think that a trial involving rape or molestation should be uh, read by young people. There's also, I don't know how many teachers even approach this, there's also a deep subtext in the book that Mayella, who's on trial, it has been molested by her father. And he's using the fall guy, Tom Robinson, as a cover for his own deeds. So that's, that's heavy stuff for 14-year-olds. So the book has been banned in a number of, uh, of places over the years, but uh, so has Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, it's remarkable how people can find things to object to. Um, what's, what, what's really interesting is that To Kill a Mockingbird was not taught in Monroeville until 1984 in Harper Lee's hometown. I talked to the first English teacher who taught the book, and I said, how's that possible? And she said, well, the general feeling was that it would give offense. And she didn't go into much detail. And uh, I pressed her, and she said, but people still recognize some of the situations that are in the book, and some of the, even some of the people that are in the book. And then she sort of trailed off. And I said, how'd you come to teach it? She said, I bought a classroom set with my own money. And this is 1984. Monroeville also um, got around the whole uh, separate but equal uh, problem, as many small southern communities did, by creating a private academy of whites only, tuition based. There is an all black public school in Monroeville and there is an all white Christian school that's tuition based, but you can get scholarship in if you don't have the money. So these things have not gone away. Other questions? Yes. Uh, the relationship between Truman Capote and Arthur Lee as portrayed in the movies that came out and then the Right. Yes. What's the theory behind that? And did their relationship deteriorate over the years after they were experiencing each other in New York? Okay, well, if you remember In Cold Blood, it's about the, um, the, uh, the, the killing of a farm family of four persons by perpetrators unknown, as the police called it. The Clutter family was murdered in their home in Holcomb, Kansas, in 1959. And the police had no idea who'd done it because it seemed motiveless. And nothing was taken except a silver dollar and a radio. So why? Who? Truman was assigned by the New Yorker to go out to Kansas to do a profile of a small town tra traumatized by a quadruple murder, which in those days was uncommon. He was worried about going because he was a very, he was a small man uh, people warmed up to him slowly because of his effeminate mannerisms. And he was just worried about going out to the Great Plains. He'd never been there before. In fact, he was so worried that he took a steamer trunk full of his favorite foods because he didn't think they might have them out there. He took tins of ham, caviar, and Jack Daniels because he didn't think they, they might ha have anything. But he thought he might dress the part. That would help. 
He wore a long lambskin coat down to his ankles, a beret, uh, a scarf wrapped around his neck three times, and he found beaded moccasins somewhere in New York. So he thought that would be his little touch of Western wear. And he was shocked when he went up to people and they said, may I help you, ma'am? He brought Harper Lee out with him because he thought that, that he, she would help him ingratiate himself with the people. And also, he gave her the job of assistant researchist, as he called it. He made up the name. He paid her $2,500 and all of her expenses to go with. And boy, was she a loyal friend. This was what was really stunning. When I went through Truman Capote's papers, I couldn't believe my eyes. I found a folder. Truman was always kind of a tease, and here he leaves this in his papers. 150 single-space typewritten pages typed by Harper Lee of all of her notes and all of her interviews done for Truman, for In Cold Blood. Character sketches, maps of areas, locations, facts, figures, all of this done for Truman. And I found instances where he borrowed because he couldn't say it any better. She was white hot from coming off To Kill a Mockingbird, and these notes read wonderfully. And sometimes he just says what she said. So you'd think that when the book came out, it would be 